Hello there. Welcome to Worship with Bethel International United Methodist Church for Sunday, January 24th. My name is Carrie, and uh, let's start today with another prayer from Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves, even our enemy neighbors. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, to be with us in our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and in our lying down, in our moments of joy and in our moments of sorrow, until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn. Amen. Now, enjoy this video from our Children's Ministries curriculum. When Jesus told the story about the boss and the three servants, I think it was really a story about you and me. God is like the boss in the story, and we're the ones he entrusted with bags of gold. Okay, so maybe God didn't actually give you a bunch of gold, but you have definitely been given something. Each and every one of us has been uniquely created. We've been given unique talents and abilities. We use different parts of our brain. We are definitely not a dime a dozen. So it's up to us to actually use what God has trusted us with. We can't just bury it in the ground and let it go to waste. And I think it's even better if we use what he's given us to make a difference in the world, to love God and to love other people. So here's the rule for life to remember today. Make the most of what you've been given. So if you've got a talent for singing, <laughs> then sing out loud and strong. If you're good at intense thinking, then think about how you can make the world a better place. And if you happen to have the talent for acting like a wild animal, then let it out of its cage every once in a while, even if it makes you look silly. Did you get it? You're right. It was a zebra. See you next time. I'm kidding. It was an elephant. A really good elephant, too. I wonder what part of the brain that was. This one? This one? This one? This one? Definitely this one. today when I was cleaning this box. It contains some things that are really important and special to me and so I hid it and that way I made sure everything stayed safe. Do you want to see what's in here? Okay. 
And let's see. Oh, Lauren wore this to a really special dance. Oh, and these are the pearls I wore when I got married. All kinds of good stuff in here. You know, I think when I'm done talking to you, I'm going to go hide this again just to make sure everything continues to stay safe. But you know, if I do that, that means I can't ever enjoy or use these things, right? Hmm. Maybe not such a good idea after all. This reminds me of our scripture for today. In our scripture, Jesus tells a parable, a story, about a boss who gives his workers some talents, some gifts. One of the workers takes his talents and he buries them. He never uses them. And in the end, he loses them. The other workers take their talents and they use them. And the more they use them, the more they grow. So what does that have to do with us? Well, each of us was given gifts specifically picked for us by God. We also call these gifts talents. The talents God gave you can be whatever you're good at. Uh, sometimes that involves a sport, or maybe it's a musical talent, or maybe you're good at drawing or problem solving or building things. Whatever the case is, God made you good at something for a reason. God made you to use your talents, and when you use your talents, they become even better gifts. You can use your talents to love and help others. You can use your talents to do good works and to make your mark in the world. When you use your gifts, you're also serving God. When you use the gifts God has given you, the gifts continue to grow and to give. Every gift is important and can change lives and make a difference. So how will you use your gifts? How will you leave your mark in the world? Have a great week. I'll see you soon. Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I, may, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. that 
she'll give faith a fighting chance. And when you've got the choice to sit it out or dance. Our children's ministry curriculum gave us this series called Rules for Life. Five rules. Number one is love God, love your neighbor. Number two, share what you have. Number three, work hard, especially at being the church and doing justice. And today we come to rule number four, which is make the most of what you've been given. Back to that in a minute. But first, I need your help in two weeks. I'm doing some additional rules. I'm going to call them rules for 2021, and they're going to come from you, right? So how do you plan to get through this year with your health, your family, your sanity, and your faith still intact? What will be your rules? Now, you know, they don't exactly have to be rules per se. Not everybody likes rules. What are your New Year's resolutions, for example? What is your motto? What words do you live by, whether this year or maybe just all of your life? What would be your best advice to your kids or grandkids, to your parents, maybe to your pastor? Share with me some funny rules. There's all sorts of funny Zoom meeting rules out there now. What's your rule for handling a time of stress and change? What's your best rule for working from home? Or what's your best rule for studying from home or hybrid school? What's your best rule for a family that's all home too much together? You know, if you want an example, here's my rule for 2021. I shared it back in December. Three words, listen for God. When I read the scripture, when I say my prayers, and before I act, especially before I speak, listen for God. God. 
And here's one that somebody shared with me by email a couple of weeks ago. She said, no, my rule is you just got to be flexible. Do I hear an amen? Huh? What's your rule for 2021? You can email it to me. You can text it. You can leave me a voice message. You can write it on a sheet of paper and slip it under my door. You can get as artistic and creative as you want. Just get it to me and get it to me this week. All right. Our scripture for today is a story, a parable of Jesus from Matthew 25. A man goes on a journey, Jesus says, and while he's gone, he entrusts his assets to his staff members, right? To one staff member, he gives five talents. To another staff member, he entrusts three talents. To a third, one talent. And the first two, they immediately take what he's entrusted to them. They work with it. They invest it. And by the time he comes back, they have double what was left with them. The third staff member, though, he takes what's entrusted to him. He digs a hole and he hides it in the ground. When the master gets back, he immediately praises those first two servants. He says, great job, you guys. You have been faithful with this much. I will put you in charge of a lot more. And then the third one comes in and says, well, I knew that you were a harsh and mean kind of guy, and I was afraid, and I took what you gave me, and I hid it in the ground. Here it is, safe and sound. And the master is irate. He says, what? You thought I was mean and harsh? Well, I'll show you mean and harsh. You could have at least taken what I gave you and, I don't know, put it in an IRA or something so I have some interest out with you. Now, that's the parable. That's the plot of the story. I want to share with you today three, one, two, three interpretations of this parable. Here's the first one. The children's curriculum understands this to be a story about responsibility. It quotes Luke 16, verse 10. Suppose you can be trusted with little things, then you can also be trusted with big things. And I understand why the children's curriculum would focus on that interpretation. You know, trusting children and trusting children with bigger and bigger things. That's one of the, the key tensions between parents and children, isn't it? Right. I mean, can parents trust their child with five talents? <laughs> will they use it well or will they fool around with it? Or more to the point, if you let your child have a phone, will they use it to stay in touch with you or will they use it to get in trouble, right? Or if you let your child take the car for a while, will they drive 55 or 105? You know, this dance of, of responsibility is key between parents and children. So the children's curriculum gives this rule about responsibility for children. It says responsibility is showing that you can be trusted with what's expected of you. That's a pretty good definition, isn't it? Responsibility is showing that you can be trusted with what's expected of you. The curriculum's rule for parents, it's a little longer, a little clunky. For parents, it says, as kids are growing up, we should involve them in practical responsibilities that they can accomplish at different ages that allow them the satisfaction of finishing work. Well, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Make the most of what you have been given. That's how the children's curriculum interprets this story. That's a good interpretation, I think. Let me add just one thing to that important lesson. You probably know that in the Bible, the word talent does not mean what we usually mean by it. It's not referring to being good at music or art or sports or something. In the Bible, a talent is an amount of money. It's a very large amount of money. Commentaries say, oh, it's 500000 or maybe even a million dollars. In other words, says Bible scholar Tom Long, what the master entrusted to these three servants was not a, a little nest egg. It was a fortune. It was a fabulous amount of money. What it was, he says, it was a symbolic amount of money. Symbolic of what? Well, here's how Tom Long puts it. He says, this parable is not a, a gentle tale about how Christians deal with their individual gifts and talents, as important as that might be. No, he says, it is a disturbing story 
about what Christians do and do not do with the gospel. You see, maybe it's not a story about whether or not children clean their room or finish their chores. Maybe it's a story about whether or not we Christians really follow Jesus. Whether we forgive people when they wrong us. Whether or not we take a stand for justice and act with mercy. Maybe above all, it's a story about whether we share the gospel with our friends and neighbors. It's about responsibility. That's interpretation number one. Here's my second interpretation for you. There's a a set of Bible scholars whose whole careers really revolves around trying to find the, the traditions, both written and oral, that lie behind the Gospels as we have them. And some of them spend their time trying to figure out, well, what would Jesus' original hearers have heard in his stories. How would they have responded to the parables that Jesus told? And Bible scholar William Herzog makes the point that no Galilean peasant farmer in Jesus' time would have heard this story and thought that the master was a figure representing God. No way, he says, they would immediately have understood that anybody with that much money had to be an absentee landlord. And they knew how absentee landlords got their money. They got it from exploiting poor people like them, from overcharging them for seed and underpaying them for grain by lending money to them at exorbitant rates of interest so they could foreclose and take their land and... They knew that, uh, that these two original servants, they knew how they doubled their money by further exploiting poor people. No, Herzog says, for Galilean peasants, the hero of this story was not the rich guy. It was that third servant, you see, the one who refused to use the master's money to further exploit the poor the one who refused to participate in anything that would make the rich richer and the poor poorer. The third servant, Herzog said, kind of stuck it to the man. (laughs) And when Jesus told this story, everybody would have stood up and cheered for him. He says, this is the way that poor peasant farmers in Latin America always understand this story until the priest tells them they're not supposed to. (laughs) It's important to know that the Bible is heard and understood in different ways by people in different circumstances. Now, I promised you three interpretations, didn't I? Number one was about responsibility. Make the most of what you've been given. Number two is don't participate in exploiting poor people. And number three is really my favorite. You might call it what to do while waiting for Jesus. Back a couple of chapters in Matthew 24, verse 3, the disciples that come and they say, tell us, Jesus, when will the end be? And what are the signs going to be of your coming back at the end of the age? And ever since Matthew 24, verse 3, that's what Jesus has been teaching them about. First of all, he says, you've got to expect hard times. There will be persecution for my followers before the end. And then he says, and don't even think that you'll be able to figure out when it's going to happen. No, he says, you've got to be alert. You've got to be ready all the time. He says, you've got to keep your lamps lit no matter how long the darkness lasts. And then he tells today's parable. He says, it's like this. Suppose a master goes away and he leaves his disciples in charge. What should they do? while he's gone. Should they just kind of sit around and wait for him to get back? No, of course not. Should they be really careful not to do anything wrong ever? No, that's not it. Should they keep their Bible shiny and fresh and their faith untested? No, of course not. They should invest the love that he's given them in other people. They should make sure that other people know the joy and freedom that they have known in Jesus Christ. However long it takes the master to get back. They should work and serve and love and invite. They should make something of each and every day they get to live. 
You see, at first glance, we might think that this is a story about money, what with the talents, the bags of gold and all. But it turns out this isn't really a story about money. It's really a story about time. And the older I get, the more I come to believe that maybe every story is really about time. What are you going to do until the master gets back? How are you going to live your life so long as there is precious breath in your lungs? Who are you going to forgive before it's too late? Who are you going to invite to church and invite to know Jesus Christ while there is still time? What risk are you willing to take for the gospel before the end comes? Several years ago, John Mayer uh, sang a Grammy Award winning song. It's called Waiting for the World to Change. Maybe you know it. It's a catchy tune. I actually like the song a lot. But it, its message is dead wrong. We're not waiting for the world to change. We are changing the world while we wait. Here's one other way of thinking about that. You know, there's a lot of people right now, they're just kind of sitting around waiting for the pandemic to end, right? They're just biding their time until, quote, things get back to normal. Newsflash, Jesus did not teach us to wait around. Jesus taught us to love and care and make something of this life. And another newsflash, there is no normal to get back to. There is only God's future to live into. And that is why here at Bethel International Church this past year, we have been investing, we've been investing our COVID time in gospel work. You see, that's why we have been standing against racism on Bethel Road and learning about anti-racism. That is why we have been learning more and more about how to share the gospel online with online worship and YouTube videos and Facebook posts. That is why we took the time to tell the story of the birth of Jesus to people driving through in their cars and in international art in a dozen different languages. You see, the question is not, will this pandemic ever end? Of course it will. The question is, what will we have to show for ourselves when the virus is finally gone? And in the Bible, the question is not, will Jesus ever come back? Of course he will question is, what are you going to do while you wait for him to come back? It's rule number four. Make the most of what you've been given. Or to put it slightly different, make the most of every moment you are given. Amen.
Go forth, my friends, to love God and serve your neighbor in all that you do. Make the most of everything and of every moment that you are given. Amen.